Good afternoon and welcome back to Kirkstone. Something a little bit different uh, right now. I've just taken delivery of some rather um, exciting amaryllis or hippiastrum, as I should really call them, but everybody calls them amaryllis, bulbs from a UK grower. And these are, um, I would say these are mid-sized for modern cultivars of amaryllis bulbs. They're in absolutely fantastic condition. You can see the uh, robust nature of the of the bulb. The leaves and the old flower stem have been cut off and the plant has been put into dormancy. And it's got these amazingly well-developed roots around the outside. Now we do have a small uh, amaryllis hippiastrum collection here at Kirkstone. A mixture of hybrids, uh, modern cultivars and species plants. <coughs> and I think it's worthwhile having a quick wander onto why I got in, interested in, uh, in these kinds of plants from a cactus background. Well, the, uh, the journey was quite straightforward really. Like most people, I got involved with cacti, in my case at a very young age, because I was intrigued by their strangeness, their unusual um, shapes, the sizes, the spikes. And I think I was around about nine or ten year old when I saw some pictures of a cacti in books. And I became really, really interested. And I did a lot of reading 50 years ago about this. And then uh, when I moved to the UK from where I was, we found there were some uh, plants that were on sale in local supermarkets. And my grandfather at the time bought some uh, plants for me because he wanted to encourage uh, an interest in horticulture and gardening because he was a lifelong gardener. And I think the first plant I ever bought was a small forcaria, forcaria tigrina, I think it was, and then a gymnocolisseum. And then a little bit after that, a friend of his gave me two seed grown plants. One was a furrocactus, a uh, furrocactus melocactiformis, and the other one was a white spined echinocactus crisonii, echinocactus crisonii alba. And amazingly, I still have both of those plants. Having travelled all over the UK, lived in different places, sometimes in greenhouses, sometimes without greenhouses, surviving on windowsills, and even once in a shed in the garden with no heating whatsoever, nearly 50 years later, I still have both of those plants. But I digress. So the journey was going from South African succulents of all different kinds to those plants which grow with succulents. So in the same place as you would find your lithops, your ophthalmophyllum, your forcarias, euphorbias, aloes, hawarthias, I became aware that there were other plants growing in and amongst them in exactly the same conditions. And of course these were the South African geophytes, the bulbous plants, the rhizomes, the corms that retreat in the dry season under the ground only to re-emerge and bloom when the cold and wet weather comes later on. So it was a logical step really from aloe and um, euphorbias and those kind of plants to boophanae, to brunsfigia, and from brunsfigia of course thence to hippiastrum, which is where we are now. So we have quite a large collection now of bulbous plants at Kirkstone, as well as cacti and succulents, but that was the the link and I kind of see them now as a xerophytic triangle between so, um, succulents there, cacti there and bulbs there, each of which adapted to arid conditions in different ways and, and working together in the um, ecosystem. So what I've got here is a large clay pot, a couple of reasons for that. First of all I like the look of clay pots, I like the aesthetic of clay pots more than I like plastic. And the other thing is because um, I already have 10 or so large uh, amaryllis hippiastrum plants in these pots. And because of the way I am, I prefer to keep things in sets if I possibly can. Now I'm going to mix some uh, phosphate, low nitrogen based fertilizer in with this special amaryllis compost. Now it's nothing special, 
It's just a general purpose bulb compost to which a small amount of fertiliser has already been added. And why am I not using a traditional nitrogen rich fertiliser? Because in my experience nitrogen rich fertilisers encourage an awful lot of leafy green growth. It's not a problem, but what we particularly want to see with the, the hippiastrums is those gorgeous, enormous, showy flowers. So I'm going to mix into here some of my favourite proprietary fertiliser. And I always give plants a single helping of this. But this one I'm going to give two helpings. Because it's a large, heavy bulb. I'm going to mix that compost in to a certain extent. And then I'm going to feed my normal grittier compost around the plant and settle it with about half of the bulb showing. Now this free draining compost that I'm adding now, of course this will keep the majority of the moisture away from the plant. And it will concentrate the nutrient rich slightly moister substrate in the lower part of the plant with the majority of the nutrient bearing substrate right at the very bottom. So the plant is now freestanding because the soil and the compost is now starting to move around those very well developed roots. So I'll tap that round because I want that substrate that really does look good. If you're into soils and composts like I am, to see something like that, even to feel something like that, it's almost a, a sensual experience. I really, really love mixing composts together. I suppose it's the same satisfaction that people who bake cakes get from putting the ingredients together because they know if the ingredients are right and the oven temperature is right and the amount of time they've allotted to bake in the cake is right, they'll make a good cake. And in the same way, if the growing medium is correct, if the temperature is correct, if the amount of light is correct, the chances are you're going to produce a very happy, healthy, and in our case, a well-flowering plant. So, what I'm going to do with this Hippiastrum papilio is just add a little bit of a substrate. Now again, there's a couple of reasons for that. One of them is aesthetic because all of the other plants in the greenhouse have a similar topping so it makes a nice set. And the other reason is it keeps the soil particles um, from washing away when the plant is just getting established. Now from the same grower I have two more large specimen bulbs. One is a beautiful red and white, uh, white fringed flowered uh, amaryllis called Samba. And the third one is a very famous and well known cultivar called Charisma. So with Charisma and Samba and Papilio, I've got the core of a really nice specimen collection. So let's have a, a quick look at the other two. I'm not going to pot those up now because the procedure is exactly the same and you'd, uh, you'd rapidly lose interest. So this is a Marilis Charisma. And look at that. That's uh, one and a half times as big again as the last one. That's an absolutely uh, magnificent bulb. I have seen bigger, but not many times. So I'll just put Charisma back in her little bag, ready for tomorrow. And this is Samba. So what does Samba look like? Oh, it's even bigger. Talk about saving the best to life. Just look at that. Now that is an big bulb.
that is a Marilis cultivar Samba with those fantastic strong well developed roots so I don't have to wait for the roots to develop we're already on the way so each bulb came within its own well ventilated brown paper bag which will keep the moisture off the plants the bag was then folded over and sealed it has a lovely carrying handle aren't they lovely so we're absolutely a fantastic delivery from, I hope you can see that, WYSIWYG Promotions. So there's a WYSIWYG, are sellers of really, really high quality Dutch Amaryllis bulbs. So these have been, been imported from Holland. Very high standard, very healthy, well rooted, very well packed. 10 out of 10 for WYSIWYG Promotions. And uh, I'm really quite excited about that. We're going to do a much more extensive video soon about amaryllids generally and about the cultivated hippiastrum plants. But we'll also do an ongoing monthly blog following um, really from repotting these bulbs up into the growth of the first leaves and the emergence of the flowers. So keep tune, tuned in regularly and follow the progress of these three plants which have just been added to the collection. So three new hippiastrums to the Kirkstone Gardens collection. It's goodbye from me, goodbye from Kirkstone, goodbye from our three new Amarolid Flens, and goodbye from WYSIWYG Promotions. They've done a fantastic job in importing these bulbs for me from Holland. Goodbye from now. See you very soon. Bye-bye. And welcome back to Kirkstone. It's an absolutely glorious Sunday morning in October. It's a very un-October-like October. And there's been quite a few developments in the um, small xerophytic South African bulb section. Um, there are some bulbs here from other parts of the world, like these species Hippiastrum. But what I'm going to do is basically uh, do a supplementary video, really, to the last one when there wasn't so much happening and all of a sudden we're sort of really hitting the growth spurt at the start of the South African winter rainfall growing season. Well I started off with a shot of the uh, Hemanthus multiflorus which has been absolutely glorious for about six weeks but the flowers are now finished but nothing to worry about because yes we have a second Scadoxus or Hemanthus multiflorus which is uh, just as glorious as its sister was. Now I have tried to uh, pollinate these by moving pollen across from one plant to the other. So we'll see whether the other one forms those lovely tripartite amaryllid seed capsules. Speaking of which, I have referred in the past to the strangeness of the genus Strumeria and, uh, and talked about the four-part life cycle, but it turns out that the Strumerias are even uh, even stranger than that. We had this plant Strumeria caruica from uh, Mindy's Plus in South Africa. And you remember the uh, flower stalks came up and there were those little tiny copies of Amaryllis flowers which were white, which were very, very heavily um, visited by flies through the summer. Uh, not surprisingly then, the, uh, the, flower, the flowers got pollinated and small three-part seed capsules did indeed form. Now before I get to that, you'll notice that after the flowers have died down, we've now got some very small hairy leaves coming up from the three plants which are in this pot, and we do have another pot which is doing the same thing. But what the interesting thing was, I noticed um, some green, bright green, like photosynthetic green, um, balls, tiny little balls were dropping onto the pebbles and I had assumed that these were uh, seed capsules containing minute Strumeria seeds but blow me on down do some more weirdness happens now I don't know if you can see that um, and I'm closing up in the sunshine but each of those league, uh, balls actually contained a tiny plant and you can actually see I hope that the seeds are actually sprouting and there's a leaf coming out of each ball. So what these are, 
are not fertilized um, ovums which are giving rise to seed capsules. These are ready-made mini plants and you can actually see on some of the capsules which haven't fallen the plants are actually sprouting on the what I'd assumed were seed capsules and they do look like seed capsules they're in three parts like any other amaryllid but there's indisputable proof that there are leaves growing from these tiny capsules and uh, well I've never seen anything like it but just as bizarre we have a, a sister plant here this is Strumeria truncata now this is one of those uh, South African bulbs from the Strumeria and um, Hesia section which produces out of its bulb a long hollow growth it looks like a, a miniature Nepenthes a miniature um, pitcher plant and out of that comes the flower stalk which is dum 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 about fourteen inches tall and also coming out of this peculiar fungus like growth there is the the basal rosette of leaves. So a very very strange plant. We have a bulb, then we have something growing out of the desert that looks like a fungus. And then a few weeks later, out of that comes both the flower and the leaves. So this uh, Strumeria truncata has got quite a different growth pattern than the Strumeria caruica we looked at before. Now what else is there to show you in terms of changes? Well, the Romulayas are, uh, have still got their spindly leaves. I don't think the bulbs are quite large enough uh, to flower, but they're hopefully they're building up some strength. And uh, we have a few other... Uh, new sightings for the year. This uh, Albuca, uh, which is uh, Concordiana, has just stuck its little leaves out of the uh, substrate. But what has come on with remarkable speed is this tiny little Lacanalia, Lacanalia ensiflora. Now the whole thing is about, what, an inch high now? And it's a completely formed miniature plant. We've got the leaves have come out of the bulb. And those tiny, tiny three or four millimetre across flowers. An absolute joy, little little gem of the desert, which will eventually form um, a mat. Now another Lacanalia that's come through is a slightly larger growing one. You can see from the leaves. This is Lacanalia paukiflora, the few-leaved Lacanalia, which is also flowered. And the leaves have got that lovely um, dark green mottling uh, to disguise it amongst the other plants that are, that are in the uh, the Karoo, which is where it comes from. So we've got a few other uh, little things going on. We've got another Lacanalia here. This is Lacanalia pusilla, another little dwarf just starting to pop up. And uh, and that's what's been happening in the, in the Lacanalia section. We've got one new Hemanthus uh, emerged. This is Hemanthus deformis, the so-called deformed or, or irregular or unsightly uh, Hemanthus and that's come on very very quickly as well and we have another new Hemanthus coming up just for the first time here this is Hemanthus Barkeri now back in the Masonia section on the first video we did there was there was no life at all but what we have got now is uh, quite a lot of development we've got a uh, Masonia Pustulata is, uh, has been a steady grower. The leaves are about an inch across now. But the other Masonias have all done, with the exception of one, have all done a lot better. Masonia hirsuta has not only grown its leaves to about an inch and a half, but is clearly forming a, uh, an inflorescence of some kind there. So the flowers won't be too long coming on that one. We've got a little tiny bit of greenery on Masonia citrina. I'm not sure if you can see any greenery there, but it's definitely there. Masonia longipace has, uh, has got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It's done really quite well. And I keep lifting the corner of this leaf up so that it won't get bent and will actually grow over the corner of the pot. Lovely, lovely crystalline um, tubercles on that plant. When the sun hits it at the right angle, it's like a leaf covered with tiny diamond. It's a beautiful plant. And again you can see that uh, inflorescent cone containing the flowers starting to develop. Then we have the three small plants of Masonia echinata. 
uh, the largest one is forming a flower and the middlest one is also forming a flower and I'm not sure if the small baby bear will bother forming a flower this year maybe next year but what has been the surprise has been the continual growth of what's starting to look almost like a miniature water lily this has been a real 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 surprise Masonia depressor the leaves are about what three inches across now and two and a half inches long uh, really really nice large plant wonderfully uh, symmetrical circular almost leaves and that strongly growing inflorescence spike there is already about half an inch high uh, really looking forward to something spectacular there and the Masonia sister genus Dorbenia again we've got uh, signs of growth there we can't say we haven't got any because we do have some we've got Dorbenia aurea just popping up out of the substrate We've got Dorbenia marginata is definitely uh, forming two leaves there. Deponia staulosa is even further ahead. So you can see the growth pattern now which distinguishes Dorbenia from Masonia. The leaves are slightly more erect and not 100% sessile at pressed to the surface of the substrate. And also the inflorescence there is starting to pop up. Uh, Debonia aurea, the red form, yep, we've even got a sighting there just popping up out of the pebbles and the same can be said of the Dorbenia zeri which is from Jacobs Bay in South Africa so quite a lot of, uh, of growth and changes in the Hemanthus, Scadoxus, uh, Lediburia, Masonia and uh, Ornithogalums, a smaller growing South African succulents. So I just thought I'd update you on the on the changes there because they're coming quite rapidly at this time of time of year. And of course to focus on that really really bizarre um, life pattern of these strumarias with the uh, the green bulbils forming out of really what should be flower pods and uh, sprouting happily amongst the pebbles. So that'll be more strumarias at some point there'll be a first come first served on these rare South African bulbs and I'll spread them around to, uh, to viewers and uh, friends and colleagues and the incredibly bizarre um, tube that comes out of the bulb of the Strumaria truncata which as I say it reminds me of nothing more than a, a tropical pitcher plant and a penthes and out of this red and green tube come the basal rosette of leaves and this lovely long it's about 14 inches high now 14 inch flower scape the only other thing really to uh, to sort of focus on is that there are some smaller Brunswickias at the back of this collection and we've got the first sign of growth on one of those as well. This is a, a Japanese hybrid between Brunswickia orientalis and Bosmanii and that is definitely in growth so that'll be getting watered at the end of the month or the first of the next month. I try to keep to the first of the month because I always remember and the Brunswickia and Buofene, they only get watered every month, literally a monthly watering. So they get five or six waterings in the year maximum. And uh, and I'll leave it there. I'll just uh, pass over the Crassulus Sturii and a couple of um, uh, Lediburias. Things are growing. Ornithogalum, Ornithogalum cordatum is making its, uh, its babies left, right and centre as it does. And uh, I'll leave you at that. A lot of work to do today. It's a beautiful, beautiful day. So I might get out in the garden or I might do a little bit of work in the greenhouse because it's, uh, it's such a nice day in the greenhouse. I'm, I'm really tempted not to leave it. But there are things to be done in the greater garden. It's a big garden, so I can't ignore it for too long. So bye-bye for now. Bye-bye from Kirkstone. Bye.